Hmm. Well, once again, it's very good to be with all of you once more on this Lord's Day. Thankful that we've had the time to come together to go through our Bible study hour. And now as we are assembled for our time of worship, we are certainly desiring to continue to be edified and uplifted as we go through and study God's Word together. Today we're going to be looking at information from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know we, we have not yet finished 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but just wanting to keep going along in the same, you know, the same book and in the same forms of conversation that we were previously so that we're not scattered here and there with just the different forms of information that we are dealing with. But we're wanting to study and look at this, you know, kind of as some introductory material into the chapter and as to why this information about the resurrection is so important. And that because the resurrection ought to be a huge piece of motivation for us as to why we are striving to live the way that we are, trying to do the things that we are striving to do, not because we're trying to earn anything, but because these are, in fact, things that are already promised to us. So Paul, in dealing with this matter, and especially dealing with it in Corinth, is because this has become another point where division is coming in. There's a division over the resurrection, Paul is going to address that and how that this, again, is designed to be an edifying and a unifying uh, element and piece of information that we have for us. So when we're considering the information that we have, just how vital it is to us, how poor we would be if we did not have the problems of Corinth. Now, when you go through problems, they're not fun. But we have been shown to us just how beneficial problems actually are. The problems of this church are helping people even today, 2,000 years later, after this information was being put together, and we're still reading about it, still making application, and still continuing to grow. And just with this section of chapter 15, how would our Bible be without chapter 15 in it? It's giving us information into the life that is to come. Now, as we go through this chapter, there are going to be a lot of questions, I'm sure, that individuals would want to ask that I'm just going to have to tell you. I don't know the answer to most of the questions dealing with what is going to happen on the other side. But with what has been revealed to us and that which, is ha which has been written, we will proclaim those things. The problem of the resurrection in this chapter and with these brethren, this is in fact a great chapter that we have. And it was not only a problem here in Corinth, but if you remember, even in the church in Thessalonica, it was a problem for them as well. Thus, we have Paul writing 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to the end of that chapter, and how that they are to be comforted by the fact and by the words that he had given to them that Christ is going to return. And that he is going to call us up and that, in fact, we are going to be changed. Now, what is going on in Corinth? They were not denying the resurrection of Christ. They believed that 100%, and Paul acknowledges that in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? They fully recognized and they had obeyed the gospel, which Paul proclaims in the very first uh, three verses of the chapter is going to include the death, burial, and resurrection. They believed that. They received that. Here is the issue that they are having. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? They're not denying Jesus' resurrection. They are denying our resurrection. So Paul addresses the resurrection of the dead. There's only two ways of exiting this world and entering into the world eternal. That, by death, or number two, our bodies changed at His appearing. This explains some things about death intended to relieve dread and fear. That when we consider death in view of Christianity, death just simply means a separation. 
It's not annihilation. It is not an extermination. But that we are simply departing and we are leaving this world to go to another. And to be able to see principles in the resurrection that we are able to be encouraged and uplifted by. So this chapter, it involves the fundamentals. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, looking at verse 1, Paul expresses the continual emphasis of fundamentals, those first principles. Here are brethren. They've been members of the Lord's church for some time. They have the miraculous gifts at their disposal. And what does Paul determine to write to them and declare unto them? The gospel. Well, Paul, we already know the gospel. Well, that may be true that you know the gospel, but guess what? You're not needing to forget these things. Because in remembering of these things, you are going to re-emphasize what it is that is already bringing you together. And in bringing you together, when you have these individuals, these false teachers that would come in and try to teach something contrary to what you've already received, you'll be able to stand against it. So Paul expresses the continual emphasis of the fundamentals. We have what Paul preached in Acts chapter 18. And how that it includes more than just what he's describing here. But Paul says that it is important to discuss this again. For me to declare it to you. There is a danger of letting fundamental truths slip from our minds. Because if they had been remembering this, okay, we've already received this information and we've received it from an apostle. So what about these false teachers that are coming in and now saying, oh, there is no resurrection of the dead? Yes, Jesus resurrected, but excuse me, but you're not going to resurrect. If they had remembered the fundamentals of what they had already received, what it was that brought them into Christianity, they would have been able to stand up quickly and been able to say, this is not the truth and been able to run the false teachers away. There is a need for remembrance in these elements so that they can, in fact, affect our lives. We've already made mention in a few other of our studies how familiarity can lead us to forget about vital truths to where it just becomes a situation where it's like, yeah, I already know that. But just because you already know it if you're not continuing to reinforce and to build that foundation, you will end up being swept away. So when we preach, though it be truths that we have heard time and time again, we need to continue to preach them with emphasis in realizing these are things that need to be brought to our remembrance. Now notice what he says about the brethren and these, this information in which he has declared to them, which also you have received. They welcomed the information. Now, you just think about the information that Paul is presenting. That if you come into Christianity, you are going to live forever. There is no other form of religion that offers eternal life the way that Christianity does. Even with the Eastern religions that promote and give the false idea of reincarnation, Reincarnation in the way that they have it described or the way that they believe it is not anything that's to be desired. Because if you don't live your life according to you know whatever their set standards are, you could end up coming back as a bug instead of coming back as a human being, as God intentionally you know created you. Whereas with Christianity, it is the idea that you yourself if you follow God's will, then you will live in paradise, that you'll be able to go to heaven. But if you live against his will, you are going to live forever, but it's not going to be in a place that you want to be. 
Idols worship had no hope of resurrection. And especially with the Greeks. Just once you were dead, that was it. And through the influence of some, as we read a moment ago, in Corinth, the resurrection was being denied. Whether it be from the Jews, which is most likely, or those who believed that, you know, the body itself is just evil. That there is no good that the body is able to be able to perform. This idea was taking a hold inside of the congregation. But in this chapter, Paul discusses the fact that Christ came to undo what sin had done. And that Christ, as a man, that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again as a man. That that physical form was brought back. And if this does not affect us, his work would be incomplete. It is designed to have an effect on us so that we, in realizing, okay, this body is going to change. So how do I need to treat this body while I have it? That is going to change, then in some form it is going to follow after me. Then I'm going to treat it with respect. That I'm going to put it towards the furtherance of God's kingdom. I'm going to use it as he has designed for me to use it in reverence and honor and virtue. And so we can further see that being illustrated when we consider the Roman letter, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. When Paul is illustrating further, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. That the work that Jesus came to do was to relieve the plague of sin and what it does against my body. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 20, 21 and 22, notice, for since by man came death, so we're on the same subject, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all die. The remedy came with Christ as a man. And that means that man is not without a body. We will not go into eternity a naked spirit. We are going to have a body. Now, I do not know what that body is. I do not know what shape, form, or what that body is going to look like. But I know that just as Jesus arose from the dead and he had a body, and that as he ascended into heaven, that his body was changed. So we too are going to receive that same thing. When Jesus ascended, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he did not do so a naked spirit. Oftentimes when we think of a spirit, we just think of it as many times as it's portrayed to us in film or books or what have you. It's just a floating ball of light or what have you. But yet when Jesus ascended, as we said, it was in a glorified body. When Moses and Elijah were seen on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had a body. The apostles knew who they were. With the tale of Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus being in Abraham's bosom, the rich man being in torment, the rich man looking across the gap, and he saw Abraham, and he knew who he was. He saw Lazarus, and he knew who he was. So we have it being shown to us that there will be a resurrection and that this body I have has an identity with the body that will be. The body of Christ was put in the grave. And the body of Christ came out of the grave. When the women showed up and then the apostles showed up, the cloth was there, but there was no body when he came out of the tomb. And that body had an identity with the body which ascended. Why this is significant is because man's sins affect man's body. It's not just a situation where we are trying to 
fix the soul. We are also trying to control these fleshly desires. For the work of Christ to be complete, his work must also involve our bodies and not just salvation of our souls. So when we think about heaven, we picture souls. But why not be pictured as men and women that stand complete? As we said, Abraham was recognized as a man in paradise. Jesus ascended as a man in a glorified body. In the world to come, we will not be naked spirits, but spirits with a body for that environment. And Paul is going to discuss that later on in this chapter. That just like this earthly body is adapted for earth, when we go to the other side, we will receive a body that is fit for and that is adapted for that environment. That God has created all things so as to fit into certain realms. Why is it that fish are placed into the sea? Because they have bodies that are made for that setting. You take a fish out of water and you put it on land. We see very clearly that body is not fit for land. So what happens? It dies. Our bodies are made for this environment. And the resurrection shows us that there's going to be a body made for us. For the next environment. And when we consider what it is that the gospel means. The gospel means good news. You just consider being an idolatrous person, worshiping these idols that do not speak, they do not hear, they do not see, and they cannot move themselves about, and that gives no hope of eternity, and then a man comes along and gives you this information that, you know what, not only can you live well on this earth in controlling the body, and fighting back the evils that sin has done to the body, but that in fact you are able to live in eternity with a glorified body. That's wonderful news. And notice it says, wherein not only had they received it, they welcomed it with gladness, but now they stand. Wherein ye stand. That this is something that we are to abide in. We dwell in this. The resurrection it affected their lives. It changed them for the better. Now, when we consider verse 30 through 32 of what Paul has to say about this, we can see why this is an important factor for us to get a handle on and to properly understand. Paul asked the question to these brethren, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage, advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. What are you saying, Paul? What's your point? Why live this way? If there is no resurrection, why suffer to fight beasts? Why suffer in the way that Paul did, being shipwrecked, beaten of the Jews, beaten by Romans, made a mockery of, made a laughing stock to the entire world? Why go through all of this if there's nothing hereafter? The very fact that we are willing to be offered up as a sacrifice, being willing to die daily, is because we will live again. If there is no resurrection, then just as he says, eat, drink, be merry. Just live it up. But we do not do that because of what is coming. The resurrection should change our outlook on life and how we live. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, Paul shows further just how powerful the resurrection is as a motivation to live as we're supposed to. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And he's already gone through and describing the type of life that he lived under the Jewish system. Born of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching religion, he was a Pharisee. And he was mighty in the position of a Pharisee. But then he says, that's all fleshly. That's all physical. And that he was willing to suffer those things. He was willing to count those things for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. What is included in winning Christ? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord? Notice verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and notice this, and the power of his resurrection. Why would Paul be willing to live the way that he did, to leave behind a system where he was benefiting above everybody else, to know the power of his resurrection? That in fact, that if he were to die, that that would not be the end. To receive that glorified body and to be able to be with the Lord. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Paul has a goal in mind that he is trying to reach. There is a reward. There is a hope that is set before us. Now, you take that hope away? What is a man without hope? He is a broken shell of himself. Hope is what gives life purpose. And for these individuals, for these brethren to allow false teachers to come in and try to take away their hope, is a truly horrifying thing that it would even be possible. But we still have those type of individuals, those false teachers around us today. There are people that run amongst us in our communities and they're teaching. There is no resurrection. That when you die, that's it. When you're dead, you're dead. You're like Rover. You're dead all over. Annihilation and extinction. If that's the case, then like Paul says, why not just live however you want to live? We cannot do that. Because of this hope and because it is connected to the body in which we're going to see. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. His eyes were fixed on the prize. That while this earth is made for us, and it's got beauties in it that are there for our enjoyment, that even the things of this earth and this creation are not to compare with the things which are before us. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he's already said, that's the resurrection. To know the power of it. Dropping down to verse 20, Philippians chapter 3. For our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation, our manner of living, it can also be translated our citizenship. In obeying the gospel, we have already been made citizens.
that our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change, notice this, our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That not only is our inward man, is our soul being changed and being delivered, but our physical body will be changed and delivered as well. So here is inspiration and motivation. Not just in the fact of resurrection, but in the fact of the kind of body that I will have. We realize that while we are here in the flesh, these bodies that we have right now, they're decaying. We can see it. For many of us, we can feel it. But knowing that there is another body should make us live differently. That even as we are getting older and this body is decaying, that that should not stop us from moving forward. That as we see these things happening and we are experiencing these things happening, that we're not viewing it as us coming to the end. But it's us coming to the point of our transformation. That we are getting to the point to where, like Paul is saying, we are going to know the power of the resurrection. Now just think of the brethren in Corinth and how they are living at this time. We're saying the proof of the resurrection is designed so as to have them live differently. But yet how are the brethren at Corinth, how are they living? Chapter 3 they're described as being carnal and babes, defiling the temple of God. Chapter 4, described as being puffed up, arrogant, egotistical. Chapter 5, there's fornication in the church and such that's not even named among the Gentiles. Taking brethren to court, chapter 6. Chapter 7, being critical of their brethren about marriage. What was there to help them not live this way? Knowledge of the resurrection. We shouldn't be doing these things because this is not our home. That we're promised somewhere else that we're going. And that in going there and receiving the body, putting off this body, this body being changed, we'll be in holiness. So I need to live in holiness while I am here inside of this shell. Notice verse 2. By which also ye are saved. That can literally be translated as by which we are being saved. So Paul is describing this salvation as a continual process. Now, this is important because many in the denominational world have the viewpoint that they got saved. Well, this is the point at which I got saved. But we are in reality still being saved. By which also you are saved, and notice this, it's based upon a condition. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, Keeping something in memory is designed so as to have an effect on how you live. Why do we have memorials establishing certain events? Because we do not want people to forget. In this country, celebrating July the 4th, why do we have that day? Is it just a day to eat hamburgers, hot dogs? Shoot off fireworks? No, it's deeper than that. It's to remember what it took, what it cost to have the freedoms that we enjoy. You don't forget these things. And so the same thing is being applied. Keep in memory what I preached unto you about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection, what it cost to make you free from your sins. And not only it making you free from your sins, 
but that it has bought you a home in heaven. And if we do not do these things, notice Paul says of these brethren, lest ye have believed in vain. You mean that what I end up doing as a Christian, if I am not remembering these things, it can become hollow, empty, without, con uh, without content, worthless, valueless? That's absolutely right. That if we are not viewing these things in light of the resurrection, what value do they have? It holds absolutely no value, no purpose. And that Paul will even say in this chapter that we Christians in believing these things and holding ourselves to these type of um, rules and regulations, these type of restrictions, he ends up saying that if this is not true, then we are the most miserable people to walk the earth. Because we're doing something with no reward with no cost. The entire system itself becomes valueless. In verse 3, For I have delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Paul is passing along what it was that he received. So thus we have tradition. Tradition simply means that which is passed down. But when we are considering the tradition in which we have what he has delivered, or excuse me, what he has received and that which he is delivering, he's not received it of any man. This is not simply a man-made tradition, but the things which he received, he received by revelation and that of Jesus Christ. And Paul, notice the system, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. He is delivering it exactly like it was given. He's not altering. He's not producing any type of change. What he has heard, that is what he has given. What did he give to them that he was buried? Verse 4. Why was this going on? There's a small word that carries about great meaning. How that Christ died and that he was buried for our sins. The word for means in our stead. Christ died instead of us. That here is the Son of God, sinless and perfect never doing any wrong, not producing any harm, but only doing that which is good to others. <clears throat> and that he would lay down his life for us. Why? So that we could be born again. So that spiritually we could be made clean. And that also physically, bodily, we could look forward to the resurrection so that we are able to stand before our God without feeling our sins. That's why he did it. That we will not be held accountable for our sins. So that we can view the resurrection as a joyful thing. That even as Christians, we can view death as a happy event. Though the ones that will be left behind to face life without familiar faces and without friends and without loved ones, and that that brings some time of sadness, there still is a time of rejoicing. that they have passed from this life with all the trials, the temptations, the sorrows, the pains that this body faces. That now that they've gone on and received a different body. 
that never grows old. Christ died for our sins. And that's designed to have us live differently. The Corinthians had forgotten that. They had allowed themselves to be deceived. To allow false teachers to come in and to remove those fundamental points. That this is the very reason why you became a Christian. Why does anybody want to become a Christian? So we can go to heaven. And then you're going to let somebody come along and try to teach you otherwise? Ridiculous. But we can see how allowing that type of concept, that type of view to creep in and to be planted and to take root, how it can corrupt and cause people to live wickedly. Well, if there's nothing to hope for after this, then let's just eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. But reminding them and reminding us of these things, of what it costs, remembering what it costs, it costs a man's life. And not just any man, it costs the Son of God. His life to make us free. Not only in our soul, but also in this body. Then let us live differently. But the only way in which these things are to be experienced and that these things are to be realized and to be rewarded, going back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, there's a key phrase that Paul uses that people need to recognize and be found in him. He had a desire to know Christ. He had a desire to know the power of the resurrection. That was in verses 6 and 7. How is a person going to have any type of hope of knowing of those things? In receiving those things, you have got to be in him. And notice what this does. Being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, and that by faith. The resurrection has not happened yet. So what am I needing to have hope and faith in that God is going to give this to us? I've not earned it. I've not gained it in any way, shape, or form. He's just opened it up to us by the sacrifice of His Son, but I have to be found in it. Or rather, to be, I need to be found in Him. How is that done? Paul tells us, the scripture tells us. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. How did the Galatians find themselves inside of Christ? How did Paul find himself inside of Christ? For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. My faith is in Christ and what he has done. By his sacrifice and the shedding of his blood, he removed the Old Testament Established the new, giving us better promises, a better covenant, better commandments. And that he created for us an opening and a way into the most holy place. That he has brought down the power of sin and the ability that it has to condemn. That if I am found in him and in his blood, that there is nothing that the devil can hold against me. There is faith in Christ Jesus, but you cannot neglect, you cannot ignore verse 27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Paul says that you have to be found in him to experience the resurrection, to receive that glorified body. He also teaches that these brethren in Galatia, they were baptized into Christ. To the Romans, in Romans chapter 6, he writes to them of how that they were baptized, not only 
into Christ's body, but they were baptized into his death. Whereas he was raised by the resurrection of the Father, that we also, in the likeness of his resurrection, are raised to walk in newness of life. What a shame that it is that so many people that have picked up the Bible, have read the Bible, and that have read of the resurrection, and they are hoping for the resurrection, but their hope is fruitless because they are not found in Christ. They are ignoring what the Scriptures tell us about how one gets into Christ. That so many people are believing, well, all you have to do is believe, ask Jesus into your heart, receive Him as your personal Savior, and that's what gets you into Christ. That's not what the Scriptures teach. That's not even what Jesus taught. Jesus taught before He did ascend to receive that glorified body. The, one of the last things that He said to His apostles was, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. How are we going to be saved? You've got to be in Him. There is no salvation outside of Christ. Salvation is found inside of Christ. We are encouraging, we are imploring, we are begging people. Put aside your man-made traditions and receive that which Paul has delivered. What the Bible teaches, what we are striving to teach this morning, is simply what Paul taught. What he received, he taught. What we have received, we taught. We continue to teach without any type of alteration, without any type of change. Because if we are going to hope for the resurrection, this is the way that we are to get in it. That we will receive the remission of our sins by going through faith and being obedient to his message. And that as we continue to strive to walk as children of God, that there are going to be times where, you know what, we go through this life and it's a difficult thing to remember that we're going to be resurrected. Because death seems like it's so far away. We view the road of life as being an extremely long journey when the reality is that death is waiting at every turn. And realizing that we're not promised tomorrow. And that not only that tomorrow is not promised, that death is ever present, but then there's the reality that Christ has promised that he would return. And that we do not know when that return is. So whether it be that death finds us first or that Christ should return and that we should be called home. The reality of the resurrection is designed to have us live differently. that we will not succumb to the temptations like that of the Corinthian brethren. That we'll be ever watchful. And that we will strive to control our flesh so that we can have our bodies be changed. And thus the need of continual cleansing the need of repentance, the confession of wrongdoing. That every day that we go through striving to do His will, realizing we may fall short. But in falling short, He has a desire that we not be lost, but that we be saved. So as we end our time together in this study, if it is the case that we at some point have lost view of what it is that awaits us and we've allowed the flesh to rule over us or to cause us to 
act in a way which is not in accordance with his will, then let's correct those things. Make those things right. Make those confessions so that we may continue to be cleansed by his blood and that we can look forward to the resurrection together.